We gather in the holy name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Dear friends, God deserves our praise and complete obedience, but our ancestors rebelled against him. As a result, we are all born with sin, a disease of the heart which causes us to think, speak, and act in ways that disobey God and separate us from his loving, comforting <coughs> presence. Instead of bringing him glory, we often bring him grief. So as we begin our worship, we reconcile with God by freely confessing our sins, turning from them, and receiving the priceless gift of pardon, paid for through the death and resurrection of Jesus our Lord. <coughs> We pray, Holy God, we confess that we often rebel and have failed to obey you as we should. We have sinned against you, not our word and action, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts, nor have we loved others as you love us. Yet you love us in spite of our sins and freely offer us pardon. Paid for on the cross by Jesus. Therefore, we ask your forgiveness so that we can worship and serve you with glad and grateful hearts. Restore our peace and renew us through the relationship and redemption the cross has made possible. Hear the good news. God the Father so loved us that he sent his only son, Jesus, to become one of us and rescue us from our sins. Jesus was sacrificed to purchase our pardon rose from death to proclaim new life for us, and will return to complete our redemption. As a result, our relationship with God is restored and our future assured. We fearlessly call on God to be present with us and confidently worship Him. Amen. Our prayer for today. Heavenly Father, thank you for rescuing us from past guilt, redeeming our present struggles, and reassuring us of a future with you. Give us the wisdom to adjust our lives on your behalf, working to grow in the kingdom as a good and faithful service. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We want to respond to that. Forgiveness uh, with a song that also kind of prepares us for some thanksgiving. Uh, we praise you, O oh God.
Our first reading this morning comes from the first chapter of Zephaniah. In this reading, the prophet warned the rich, powerful, adulterous, and apathetic that an army would soon deliver the Lord's judgment against Jerusalem. Be silent before the sovereign Lord, for the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated those that he has invited. On the day of the Lord's sacrifice, I will punish the princes and the king's sons and all of those clad in foreign clothes. On that day, I will punish all who avoid stepping on the threshold, who fill the temple of their gods with violence and deceit. And on that day, declares the Lord, a cry will go up from the fish gate, wailing from the new quarter and a loud crash from the hills. Wail, you who live in the market district. All you merchants will be wiped out. All who trade with silver will be ruined. And at that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps and punish those who are complacent, who are like wine left on its dregs, who think that the Lord will do nothing, either good or bad. Their wealth will be plundered, their houses demolished. They will build houses, but not live in them. They will plant vineyards, but not drink the wine. The great day of the Lord is near, near and coming quickly. Listen, the cry of the day of the Lord will be bitter, the showing of the warrior there. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of trouble and ruin, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness, a day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the corner towers. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <coughs> the responsive reading from Psalm 90. The psalm is attributed to Moses who calls on the eternal God to protect us mortals from the wrath that we deserve, giving us wisdom instead. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the world. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn the evil back to dust, saying, You turn to dust, mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by. Or like a watch in the night. Yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like the grass in the morning. In the morning it springs up new. And by evening it is dry and withered. You, you are consumed by your anger and terrified. By your indignation. You have, you have set our enemies before us. Our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away from your God. And we finish our years with a moan. Our, our days is to come to seven years. years. Or eighty if the strength endures. Yet, Yet the best of them are the best For they quickly pass and we fly away. If only we knew the power of your anger. Your wrath is as great as the fear that is your due. Teach us to number our days, that we may gain our heart wisdom. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, the Lord of God. Amen. And the epistle reading this morning is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And in this letter, Paul encourages believers to be ready for Christ to return and fulfill his promises, but not to speculate about when that time will be. Now, brothers, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you, for we know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains as a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who <coughs> drunk get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled putting our faith and our love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For 
God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as, in fact, you are doing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We want to take a moment to respond to the readings that we just had, which are very pointed, both in their judgment and also in the salvation offered to us by God. And it's hard to tell, let me tell you, to find songs that, that really bring out both. But this whole hymn does that. It brings out both the, the judgment of God, but also his mercy in Jesus. So we invite you to sing with us, The Day is Surely Drawing Near. How are you this morning? Good. Are you sleepy like me? Yeah. So, Parker, I brought some money that I'm just going to give to you. And uh, it's not a lot, but it's real money, okay? So here you go. And I'm going to give you a choice, okay? There used to be a game show like this called The, the, the Price is Right, I think. But uh, you can either keep that money or you can go give it to Renee over there, right? 
So, so that's your choice. And you can see what happens. <laughs> so what do you think you want to do? How much do you have there? Five cents. Okay. So the stakes, what do you think? High or low? What do you all think you ought to do? You know, the audience is always yelling, right? Keep it. Keep it. What are you going to do? Give her half. You're going to give it to her? Okay, go ahead. Give it to her. Just go straight by the audience. Okay. Cool, cool. And, uh, Oh, she's, she's coming to you, so. I have something for you. Ooh. <laughs> so what do you think? Was that a good deal? Yeah? yeah? <laughs> and how much do you think you have there? <laughs> Looks like it might actually be a couple dollars. Yeah. <laughs> you could actually buy something with that. <laughs> yeah, I want to come down front. <laughs> Those people out there, they want to make this deal too. At least a dollar. At least a dollar. Yeah, I'm thinking more. So, and the reason I gave that to you is because uh, we're about to hear a story that Jesus tells in which uh, a master who has a lot of money gives his servants some money and, and he tells them to invest it. Okay? So you know what investing is, right? That's when you put your money into something that you think is going to produce more money. Or it could be you put your time into something that you think is going to be really worthwhile. And in God's kingdom, when we invest in somebody else, our time or our talents or our money, we not, might not see a return quite as fast as you just did. Right? But God promises us that on judgment day, whatever we've given for his sake will be rewarded. Right? So that's what the sermon's going to be about this morning. And I, I just thought I'd, you know demonstrate that with you. So I appreciate you doing that. Why don't you guys all pray after me. Dear God, Dear God thank, you thank you for giving us, for giving us so, much so much to invest, to invest in, in your kingdom. In, your kingdom. in Jesus. Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay. Thanks for coming up here. I appreciate it. Our gospel reading this morning is taken from Matthew's account of Jesus' life, uh, chapter 25. We're getting towards the end of the church here, and we're getting towards the end of our readings through Matthew's gospel. Out of reverence for the words of Jesus, I invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel. In this parable, Jesus does invest, uh, encourage his followers to invest their lives for his benefit and not bury their talents as they await his return. Jesus said, Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with the two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid, 
and I went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here's <coughs> what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be <coughs> taken from him. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. I invite you all to be seated. Years ago, I heard a joke about a man who went into a bar and he brought his dog in with him. And the bartender said, hey, we don't allow dogs in here. And the man said, oh, but this is a talking dog. And the bartender said, no, he's not. And he said, no, really, he is. I'll, I'll bet you a round of drinks that this dog talks. And the bartender said, OK, you're on. And the man said to the dog, OK, Fido, what's that part of the building that's above us? And Fido said, roof. <laughs> and the bartender said, all right, that's enough. Every dog says roof. You get out of here. And the man said, no, 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 I'm, I'm sorry. Here, let, let me try again. And said, Fido, how do I look today? And the dog said, rough. <laughs> and the bartender said, ah, oh, come on. You're, this, you're just making this up. All dogs make those noises. He goes, hey, just, just give me one more chance. He said, Fido, who was the greatest major league baseball player of all time? And the dog said, Ruth. <laughs> and with that, the bartender called the bouncer, and they threw the man out of the bar. And he landed on the sidewalk, and the dog came up to him and said, gee, I'm sorry. Should I have said DiMaggio? <laughs> <laughs> I tell that joke because, you know, it's always good to start with some humor if you're going to focus on an end time parable of Jesus. <laughs> but also because I want to point out that almost everything in life is a gamble. We don't normally think of it that way, but almost everything's a gamble. We choose movies at my house on uh, Netflix or another streaming service, and we're gambling. There have been quite a few times that Renee and I have said at the end of the movie, we're never going to get that two hours back. <laughs> it wasn't a good gamble. We gamble when we see a cookie in the refreshments table and we say, is that cookie worth the calories? And generally here I can tell you it's going to be. We gamble when we exercise. We know it's good for us, but the question is, is it worth the time and the energy? And generally, we believe that the answer is yes, that it's an investment. We gamble in relationships. If I marry this person, will they be faithful to me? Through better or for worse, will they be with me the rest of my life? We gamble when we buy a house. Will this house maintain its value? Will it actually appreciate? We gamble when we invest in any kind of an a stock market investment. I, I used to work as a financial associate and I had to convince people that they had to invest according to their level of comfort with risk. That there was risk in every investment, no matter what it was. And they had to be prepared for whatever that risk was. But I'd also remind them, but I'm not investing. They were also gambling. Because generally, if you don't invest, there's going to be inflation and your wealth is going to lose its value <coughs> over time. And even if you put it in the bank, that's a very conservative investment, a conservative gamble, but it's still a gamble that you're gonna get more interest than the rate of inflation so that you don't lose money. Almost everything in life, when you think about it, is a gamble, unless you know the future, right? Unless you know that there's a sure thing out there somewhere. And you and I are here today because we believe that God has revealed to us a sure thing. And that sure thing is salvation and eternity with God. Not because of what we do, but because of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. 
If it were according to what we do, we know that we wouldn't make it. The investment wouldn't pay off. And, and there are people that try really hard to be good enough, but the reality is Scripture reveals to us it's not going to be enough. It is a holy God who judges us. You heard some of that in the Old Testament lesson. And we will not be able to pay up. We will not be able to meet the bar of his judgment. But his son, Jesus, met that bar, met that standard for us. He lived a righteous life. And by faith in Jesus, we have a sure thing. It doesn't depend on us. But we can be in eternity just by trusting that Jesus was who he said he was and did what he said he would do. So what's the parable about today? What's this story that Jesus tells? Well, I want to point out that it's about talents. Now, we get the English word talent from this parable. In Jesus' day, a talent was not a skill or an ability. A talent was a unit of weight. And because it was a unit of weight, it was how they measured out money. So I looked it up this past week. If the talents Jesus is talking about are gold, a talent is about 130 pounds. So we're talking about $4 million per talent. If it's silver, it's more like $40,000. But it's still a substantial amount, something that you can do something with. It's not negligible at all. I know Parker's wishing that I'd given him a talent. <laughs> so would his father. <laughs> <laughs> but we get the English word talent to mean a skill or ability because throughout history the Christian church has understood that Jesus wasn't just talking about wealth. He was talking about everything that God gives us, including our unique abilities. Because we sometimes say, oh, you're so talented. Meaning you have so many skills and ability from God. And, and, and yet we believe that God gives each of us different talents in different amounts according to our ability. And it turns out that God wants us to be always investing those talents in his kingdom. Because that's the sure thing. You can invest your talents in, in popularity, but it will fade. You can invest your talents in making money, but the book of Ecclesiastes tells us, and we've seen this again in history, you're going to have to pass it on to the next generation, and they might not deserve it. You can invest your talent in all sorts of things. This parable encourages us to invest in God's kingdom, because it is a sure thing. Not in this life, but in eternity, on the day of judgment. And I want to pull out a couple of ideas from this parable that I think are worth pondering. And the first one is that accountability is always growing. Accountability. That, that is to say, the longer we're at it, the more likely we are to be judged. You know, Jesus compares his return on judgment day to this master, this businessman who's been away. And he says, after a long time, the master returned and settled accounts. Early believers, like those in, in Thessalonia, the, the epistle reading we had for today, they believed that Jesus was going to come back at any time. In fact, they were distressed because it had been a couple of decades, and Jesus hadn't come back, and, and it made them worried. So Paul wrote that letter in part to assure them. He says, don't, you know, don't worry about the day or day, right? Because Jesus has revealed it'll be like a thief in the night. It'll be unexpected. This return of Jesus to remake everything and Judgment Day. And Jesus had warned this too, that his return would be a surprise. He warned the people that the destruction of the temple would come within one generation. And it did. And it's 70 AD. One generation, according to Jewish math, was 40 years so right around 40 years after Jesus, the temple was destroyed by the Romans, not one stone left upon another, and that's the state that it's still in today. But his return, he said again and again, would be like a thief in the night. It would, it would be a sudden surprise, and wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and the world falling apart would just be a sign that his return is coming, but they wouldn't mean that it was imminent. 
Any more than going into labor means that 10 minutes from now you're going to have a baby. Okay? Uh, and Paul uses that image again and again. But because it's been a long time, a lot of people kind of forget this. They kind of lose this edge, this belief that Jesus could return at any time. They start to think, well, Jesus hasn't come back yet, so <coughs> the odds are he's not going to come back. But here's the thing. Just because it's been a long time doesn't mean he's not coming back. In fact, it means we're way closer to his return than people in the first century would were. In other words, the odds are way higher for us than they were for them. That Jesus could come back in our lifetime. I'm not saying it will happen, but we, like they, need to be prepared. And part of that preparation is to recognize that accountability <coughs> grows over time. Here's what I mean by that. Anybody remember in 1998 there was a, a huge settlement of the tobacco industry uh, that the four biggest tobacco companies had been sued in a suit that was joined by 46 attorneys general of various states. And they lost. And the settlement was $206 billion that the four biggest tobacco companies agreed to pay out to various states. It wasn't a payment to the victims, necessarily. It was a payment to the states for the health costs, the added health care <coughs> costs that the states had incurred due to this. Not that tobacco was found to cause lung cancer, <coughs> but that the four biggest tobacco companies knew in the 1950s that smoking tobacco caused lung cancer. And that they had for 50 years worked together, conspired to sow doubt in the findings that smoking was a high probability of leading to lung cancer. They had created <coughs> campaigns and products like light cigarettes, suggesting that your risk was less if you smoked light cigarettes, which wasn't <coughs> true. They had built their business selling tobacco overseas to countries that didn't have this knowledge of this link between lung cancer and tobacco. In short, they had buried this information in the ground. But there was going to be judgment eventually. And that judgment in this case was $206 billion. If they had admitted right away that these findings were likely true, and if they had gone into some different business, do you think that the, the settlement would have been anywhere near that big? No. It's the fact that they denied it for so long. And this is what we find in this parable too, right? The guy who buries his talent in the ground is in denial that the master is coming back. Even though he claims that the, the master is such a harsh businessman. And this is what we have to recognize about God is that he gives us all these gifts for us to enjoy, but also for us to invest. And the time that we're given and the gifts that we're given are things that we will be held accountable for. And, and here's the second thing. Faithful servants serve God and invest their gifts. They invest them in his business. So the master says, well done, good and faithful servant, to the first two who've done that. You have been faithful with a few things, I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. The idea here is that investing in God's kingdom, because it's a, it's a sure thing that he will invest us for what we, that he will reward us for what we do, is a source of happiness. It's the one place I can put my time and energy in this life that I know will be rewarded in eternity and not just fade away. And it doesn't depend on how many gifts we've been given. You notice the master never says anything comparing these two servants, right? And, it's, and he never says anything about, ah, oh, four talents, huh? oh, that's, that's great, that's enough to meet my bar. Instead, he's just happy that they've done what he asked them to do, right? That he has done his will because he knew that they would be rewarded, that he would reward them for that. <coughs> it's not about how much we have, 
we see. It's about what we do with it. In fact, Jesus at one point is in the temple with his disciples and, and he sees this poor widow who puts two small coins, the smallest coin they had, into the offering uh, at the, the temple. And he points to her and he says, do you see that woman? She has given the most. She is the most generous. Because others gave a lot of money out of what they had, but it was just a portion of what they had. She gave everything she had. Everything that she had to live on. This is what God calls us to do. It's to give our all. Right? To not be distracted. To keep in mind the source of real reward. And we don't have to have a lot. A few years ago I read about a, a, a boy in Texas uh, uh, who was named Jackson Taylor. At 11 years old he decided he wanted to do something for the local homeless shelter. So he ha had a, a lemonade stand. And it did well. And he was so happy about how well that had worked out that he had raised a, a bit of money for the local homeless shelter that he organized a dinner, a charity dinner, for this homeless shelter in, in order that they might have a great dinner for Easter. And he raised more money for that, and it emboldened him so that he would go straight to donors and ask donations for the local homeless shelter. And by the time he was 13 years old, he'd raised $72,000 for the local homeless shelter, to give children presents at Christmas time, to give them some joy, to give them some hope, to give them necessities, things that they needed. And let me ask you, do you think this kid has a bright future? <laughs> yeah, because to those who do well, who know how to invest, more will be given. But here's the other side. Faithless servants slander God, and they waste their gifts. You know, the, the master seems very harsh in saying, you wicked, lazy servant. So you know I harvest where I've sown and gather where I've not scattered seed. You should have put my money on deposit with the bankers. Now it's easy to understand why this guy would be called lazy, right? But why wicked? Wasn't he just playing it safe? Well, here's the thing. There's no evidence in this story that the master is actually a master who harvests what he hasn't sown, is there? Jesus doesn't say that that's true. He just says that's what the third servant says. In fact, the Jewish people would know that testimony of two witnesses is required. And you notice the first two witnesses do not corroborate the picture of the master that the third guy is painting. Now, it seems really obvious the third guy is painting this picture and probably has worked the whole time the master was gone to justify his not doing the master's will. He's not invested. He's created this picture of this harsh master, which you and I would say is not true, given the fact we can see into this parable and we can see who the master is. Right? That this is God, and, and he calls himself Father, and we worship him as Father. Right? This is not the character of God. But there are people who turn God into the harsh master who believe, it's my money, it's my life, I can do with it what I want, and dare, God, how dare you ask me for any of what's mine? Not realizing everything we have was given to us by God, and he asks us to invest it for our benefit, and for the benefit of others, for the benefit of the kingdom. <clears throat> you and I recognize God as father. And good parents don't shame their children. They don't pile guilt on their children, especially when the children have failed, right? They say, you did your best, and I'm proud of you. And this is what God calls us to do. Our best. Because we understand that he is a loving God, a loving father, who wants the best for us. And when he asks us to do things, when he calls us to invest our talents, he does it because he knows that we will share his joy to the extent that we invest in his kingdom. He wants the best for us. And so this is the bottom line. Faithfulness brings joy. And faithlessness brings grief. 
The master concludes, concludes, throw that worthless servant outside into darkness where there is weeping and gnashing. Why is he condemned? Not for his lack of profit. He's condemned for his lack of faith. His lack of faith, his lack of trust in what the master told him. The author of Hebrews in chapter 11 says this, Without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe he exists and rewards those who earnestly seek him. And the beginning of John's gospel says, on the other hand, to all who received him, Jesus, who believe in his name, he gives the right to become children of God, to become those who belong in God's family, who are assured of what God's attitude is towards them because they believe that Jesus was who he said he was and did what he said he would do for us. And this is God's measure of success. It's faith. It's knowing him and trusting him with our lives. Those who slander him to excuse themselves miss out on the kingdom of God. Those who trust in God, trust him to be their loving father, are rewarded with their master's joy in Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you now to stand as we confess the Christian faith, putting this parable in the context of the entire picture, the faith that was handed down to us by the apostles. And so we speak to one another and say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the promise of Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose to him from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. This morning in our prayers, I want to include uh, Paul and Kenzie Brooks. They are not members of our congregation, but Paul is the son of Dana Brooks, uh, one of our fellow pastors in the Treasure Valley. Uh, Paul and, and Kenzie went to the hospital to deliver their daughter on Tuesday, and their daughter, Aurora, was stillborn. And, uh, and then they went home, and then uh, Kenzie has developed an infection, and she's had to go back to the hospital. So we want to pray for the healing of their hearts and the healing of her body. We join our hearts together now in prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for your promise to reward all that we do to serve you. Guide us through your spirit to see the opportunities you set before us and give us wisdom to invest our lives in growing your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. In your mercy. Work in the hearts of all those who are not prepared for your return. Guide your churches so that we avoid becoming bogged down in those things which have no lasting value in your kingdom, and instead unite around proclaiming your redemption to a world which has no other hope. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Strengthen, protect, and defend those who suffer hardships and persecutions because of their commitment to you. Defend, provide for, and bring peace to those in the nations of this world who are being viciously and unfairly attacked. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Guard our families and friends from all harm of body and spirit. Heal those struggling with physical and mental illness. Free those oppressed by demonic forces. And give courage to those struggling with grief or addiction. Guide and preserve those who protect and serve us in medical, military, or public service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Because you have promised to hear us, we pray especially for the following people and situations in need of your love, healing, and power. Intervene according to your goodwill, Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Together we pray for your will to be done. In the words of Jesus, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive of those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. In order to strengthen our faith by reassuring us that what he did was done for us, for our redemption and our eternal life, our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, Jesus took the cup. After supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. I invite you to take a moment to prepare your hearts to rightly receive communion. We do that by remembering that we are sinful in the eyes of God. But we believe that Christ is here present through this bread and wine connecting us to his sacrifice so that we are forgiven of our sins. And we also believe that the Holy Spirit is given to us in order to reshape our lives and give us new life so that we can grow into the people God made us to be. If you've considered all of these things and are holding nothing against anyone else, I invite you to come forward for the distribution of communion. We do have uh, non-alcoholic wine and gluten-free wafers. For those who desire that, just let us know when you come forward. I invite you to be seated now for the distribution of the meeting.
with his body and blood strengthen and preserve you. Keep you strong in the true faith in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Go in peace. I invite you now to stand and receive the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. We invite you to stay standing and join us in our closing song, Bless the Lord. Oh, dear.